Sorry, this is in two parts. I had a bit of a technical difficulty there. Now, I was talking about the, um, the, the levels that we use in uh, a radiology department and, and in endocrinology as well. They, they'll use these zone, zonal areas. Um, so when we divided up the submental area over to the angle of the, of the mandible um, and inclusive of the anterior belly of the digastric is going to be that level one area. Once we move to that posterior uh, belly of the digastric and um, along the um, sternocleidomastoid and you know deep to that is going to be your IJV, you're going to have that cervical, uh, deep cervical chain that runs along the IJV. And we refer to these lymph nodes uh, when we are looking at the hyoid bone as our marker. Anything that is above the lower margin of the hyoid bone, that's going to be your segment or level two. And once we move below the hyoid bone, we, we move into level three lymph nodes. Um, and those will use their landmark as um, the cricoid, that lower margin of the cricoid cartilage. And then below that is going to be our level four. And so these are the main main areas you're going to be looking when you are scanning. There are, there's additional levels. If we go into the posterior triangle, we're looking at level five. If we look along the central trachea, we're going to be looking at level six. And then down by the um, jugular notch, we're going to be looking at level seven. Um, all of these things are uh, have uh, some predisposition to either one etiology or another. Things that tend to be up in this one and two area tend to be, have an infectious etiology. This is not set in stone. This is just a statistical tendency. And for the cancer, we're, we're looking at three and four. Now, um, if we see nodules in the thyroid, it is incumbent upon us as sonographers that we do evaluate the lymph nodes up and down the chain just to look for any reactive lymph nodes of any kind. So how does a lymph node look under normal circumstances? You'll hear the term reniform when we are talking about the lymph node. And so the reniform shape, renal, reniform, means that it has a kind of kidney-like shape to it. And ultrasonically, uh, it'll have a similar appearance in terms of an outer cortex and then this bright inner area, much the same way when we're looking at a kidney where we have that outer uh, cortical area and that inner sinus area. The brighter area within the lymph node is referred to as the fatty hilum. There's a little bit of fat in there and we also then have that doorway for the vessels to come in and out and for the efferent um, vessel to go out as well. As you know, the lymph nodes are going to have quite a number of afferent um, branching coming in. Uh, we'd not uh, typically be able to make those out, uh, but we can make out the hilum, and um, and I'm going to show you that in a, in a little bit. So these calipers are here to demonstrate what we consider a normal lymph node. So when we look at the lymph node and measure its longest length and compare it to um, its AP or width length, because those are going to be very similar, but if we compare it to that AP, we want the ratio to be greater than two. So the long axis to short axis measurement greater than two in, indicates a normal, thi um, normal lymph node. When lymph nodes become reactive, um, or uh, have um, been infiltrated with cancer, then uh, they begin to get a more rounded appearance or they get a more lobular appearance. And I'm gonna show you a couple of those. But before I show you those, I want to caution you or at least give you a heads up that cervical nodes may just appear as these hypochoic uh, almost like little jelly beans. As you're moving up and down the neurovascular bundle with your probe, you're going to see this little rounded structure come into view, and as you pass by it, go out of view, and then the next one comes up the, into the view because you know, they're in chains. And you may or may not be able to visualize the hilum. So if we look back at some of these uh, images that I've already showed you, 
we have the ECA and the ICA, and I had pointed out that we have two little jelly beans up here. So we have our little lymph nodes um, uh, up um, more superficial. Uh, and then, and as you run up and down this neurovascular bundle, they can show up all around this area. So if we go down to level four, now this is level three right here. We're up by the um, below the hyoid bone, uh, um, probably above the cricoid. And uh, so we're at level three. At level four, once I begin to see the thyroid gland, a good portion of the thyroid gland, uh, more towards the midsection and on inferiorly, then I'm at level four. So here's our CCA and our IJV, and remember they're going to run along the IJV or be more adjacent to them. And so we have a small lymph node here, kind of hypoechoic, so that's why I was warning you, you're just, uh, you, you may just see these little hypoechoic little beans in here. This one is a little bit larger and you have a hint of the hilum. So that's what I mean by a poorly visualized fatty hilum but your eye will begin to pick up on them as you go. Now, this is actually a really large um, lymph node. It, it however, is not, um, has not lost its ratio. And I like this image. This is compliments of Dr. Torino, and this is actually um, a, a um, inguinal lymph node. And what I like about it was just how clearly, look how kidney shaped it looks. Remember when you look at a transverse kidney and you can actually see the vasculature um, in and out. And in fact, as she was able to get, see if I can get this to play. There we go. She was able to get a really impressive vascular flow pattern on this. And you can try putting flow uh, you want to put real low flow pattern onto the lymph nodes in the neck, but they will tend uh, to not show up really well. But if you happen to see a larger lymph node, you'll be able to see that hilum and that vasculature going in. All right, so how do cervical lymph nodes know, look like when they're abnormal? And as I've said, they begin to lose that reniform shape and become more rounded. In addition, they begin to get really quite hypoechoic and can lose that fatty hilum. You, 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 can't, you can't see it. It gets so compressed that you, you can't even see it. Sometimes that you just get a very lobular appearance to the cortical area, even though you still can see the fatty hilum. So they're going to be very deeply hypoechoic. They're usually going to be enlarged, not always but they're usually going to be enlarged. And what does enlarged means and mean in terms of lymph nodes? It means that greater than a centimeter, greater than 10 millimeters, except for the jugular digastric. That one can be as much as 15 millimeters. Now, as the name implies, you're going to be near the IJV and you're going to be near the digastric, rather the posterior belly of the digastric. So up in that level two area is where you're most likely find the jugular digastric, or one that seems a little larger than all the rest. Also, like I said, you start to lose that long to short ratio, short axis ratio starts to get less than two, so they become more round. And those irregular borders and lobular areas. Loss of the fatty hilum, so let's take a look at that. So here we have a very rounded appearance to these, um, um, to these lymph nodes. They look very abnormal. We're, we cannot make out the hilum too well on this one here. This one still um, has a little bit of its shape to it, but look how rounded and look how deeply hypoechoic these lymph nodes have become. And we look at this lymph node down here. This is what I was talking about. It still has a hilum, but look how thickened this cortex has gotten. And this would be very suspicious for um, for metastasis of cancer, that there is some cancer inside of this lymph node. And there seems to be an abnormal lymph node over here as well. But this one is really grossly abnormal where you get that thickening of the cortex. Now, this one is huge. So we have a very, very, very large lymph node here, maybe lymphoma of some kind. And so, um, you can see that the IJV has been really 
very displaced. Here is the CCA. And this thyroid gland actually has a nodule in it. And when we talk about the thyroid gland in a little bit, um, we're going to talk about nodules that you can see in the thyroid gland and, and how we classify them. So uh, of note, um, if there is a papillary cancer in thyroid, it has been found that uh, pretty often a, a lymph node will have um, cystic components to it. And those uh, cystic components, um, when uh, they look at these lymph nodes under histology, often are indicative of papillary cancer. All right, we're ready to switch gears one more time. Let's take a look at this thyroid gland and um, it's kind of the star of the show here, right? Well, maybe not. Um, I, would, I would argue that the vessels think they're the star of the show, right? So the thyroid gland um, is going to be, as you know, it's going to be that kind of butterfly shape uh, structure that will overlie the uh, trachea with a lobe on either side of it and an isthmus joining it. And we'll talk about this little structure here in a moment. And we can see that um, it will have a uniform gray tone to it, a little bit more hypercoax, still in that mid-gray, but, but a, uh, at the higher end of mid-gray. And we can see in comparison to muscle that it is hypercoax to the muscle. But before I get further into that thyroid gland, let's talk about other relational anatomy that you can see uh, in that little area of just looking at the thyroid gland in transverse, there is an enormous amount of anatomy that can be identified. So, but before I pick out that anatomy, let's briefly look at the muscular triangle, which is one of those sub-triangles of the anterior triangle. And as you know, the muscles are, or as you had in the previous lecture, the muscles are going to be named after uh, their attachment points. And these are going to be the infrahyoid muscles, better known as the strap muscles. And as you've seen, they are, they do look like, like little pieces of tape, don't they? Uh, like little straps. So closest or the deepest one is going to be your sternothyroid, your sternothyroid, meaning it's going from the sternum to the thyroid cartilage. So when it says thyroid, we're not talking about the thyroid gland, they're talking about the thyroid cartilage, and it knits together with the thyrohyoid uh, to, to kind of almost make this continuous progression of muscle from the sternum to the um, hyoid. Overlying that, we have our omohyoid. And remember, our omohyoid is attaching to the shoulder, as omo means, and it'll take this sharp, um, or actually it's more of a swooping, lateral turn and reach out towards the shoulder. And you can see it on this side going underneath the sternocleidomastoid, which is that nice big muscle that we can grab a hold of. And makes a, this muscle makes a wonderful landmark for us as well. And then continues on to the shoulder. And then um, overlying all of that more superficial is going to be that sternohyoid. So from the sternum to the hyoid bone. Now, I want to point out a posterior muscle that becomes a landmark for us when we're setting our depth to look at the thyroid gland, and that's going to be your longus coli. So your longus coli, right here, longus coli, and that just means long neck muscle, um, is going to run alongside the bodies of the um, vertebral bodies here. Now. Let's bring up an image and talk a little bit more about what other muscles and uh, structures that we can see. Let's think about our scan plane again. This is a transverse scan plane. So of course we're anterior to posterior again on the body. And if we use convention, which we always do when we're looking at the thyroid, the toe of the probe should be pointing to the patient's right and the heel of the probe should be pointing leftward. And we have um, the image of the trachea right here. This is the trachea. And then um, we have our neurovascular bundle here. We've already talked about the CCA and the IJV. And what I haven't talked about is that other structure that runs with it. And this is uh, the vagus nerve. This is cranial nerve 10. 
which will ride right along with it, all enclosed within that tight carotid sheath. But let's go back up to the surface here. When our probe is touching the skin, we can make out a one to two millimeter hyperechoic area that represents the epidermis and dermis. And then deep to that, we should see the subcutaneous tissue. The subcutaneous tissue will be relatively hyperechoic and it will have this, um, these um, uh, collagen linear densities here that wrap the little lobules of fat that are protective, um, protectiveness provided by the subcutaneous tissue. Now, think about for a moment that big sheet of muscle that we think of as the, that uh, one of the muscles of expression that are running from the jaw downward and um, very, very, very thin, paper thin. And you remember that that's going to be your platysma. Remember the platysma. Now it's very thin, it's very superficial. So we would look up here in our anterior area. And if you look at this little thin, dark line in between some fascial planes here, this is indeed the platysma coming all the way across. Now the next big monster muscle we should hit a little bit more lateral in position is going to be the sternocleidomastoid. And it will always have this triangular appearance and it will point medially um, at the, at the uh, trachea. So that those kinds of, of uh, those kinds of configurations help you determine whether or not you're looking at a left side or a right side. And then if we're down here, look at that relationship of the omohyoid right underneath, because this is our box, but if I use this side to illustrate, we're going to have that omohyoid under the sternocleidomastoid, and it should be a thin strap-like muscle which indeed it is. So here is the omohyoid. And then as we were talking about the other two strap muscles, we have the um, sternothyroid right here, the sternothyroid, and then we have the sternohyoid overlying. So in general, just being able to know that this line of, of tissue and structures, this is gonna be your strap muscles. And we get, again, we hit our neurovascular bundle and deep to that IJV, Here's one of those nice little lymph nodes, one of those little jelly beans. Now, we want, again, our thyroid gland to have that uniform um, echogenicity as we're going through, or rather, echo texture as we're going through, and its echogenicity is going to be at a higher grade than that of the muscles. Okay, so I, the last thing that I want to point out, then, is the longus coli. So we talked about the longus coli being our um, landmark, so we're setting our depth. We don't see it well. Um, but the sound beam attenuates quite a bit in this area by the time we get back here. Remember, this is a linear probe, so all that energy gets eaten up pretty fast as it's going deeper into the body. And we set our depth there. We set our focal zone at our area of interest, which is, of course, if we're looking at the thyroid, is going to be at the most posterior aspect of the thyroid. So we see quite a lot of anatomy in just this small space, and it was all about understanding that relational anatomy. All right, so I want to briefly touch on the patient position and the probe orientation because I actually want to um, get to the pathology or end on the pathology of the thyroid. So to get to these structures, we want to be sure that we have the neck, our, our chin upright. So we have a little bit of hyperextension to the neck. And so this is where I'm going to want you to take that pillow out from underneath your patient or put the pillow underneath the shoulders, as you can see here. And I want you also to notice that this patient has her chin pointed a little bit away from the sonographer and the sonographer is looking at the right side. And so that it would be the proper position to look at the right. Now, I'm just going to point out, um, if we were doing this live, I would be asking you what is our orientation here. And I'll just tell you, we are long axis here. The probe is going, the probe notch, the toe of the probe is going to be pointing towards the patient's head. 
So what is that going to look like? I hadn't shown you what the thyroid gland looks like when it's in long axis, and this is how it looks. So here's our superior, here's our inferior, and here is that outline, that shape, sort of triangular, isn't it, of the thyroid gland. And this is pretty typical. And we still have our strap muscle, and we even have, can make out the platysma here as well. And typically we would put our calipers um, at its most superior aspect and inferior aspect to get a long ac axis measurement of it. So what about in transverse? Again, you just want that hyperextended or mildly hyperextended. And notice that the sonographer is scanning the left side here and notice that the chin is slightly pointing towards the um, uh, sonographer this time, or it's going to point to the contralateral side of where you are scanning. So this is a transverse image, and so what would our image be? You've been looking at this through this whole lecture. And so on the left side, this, is, uh, this particular probe is placed very much over top of the trachea. And notice these reverberation artifacts, reverberation artifacts. And in fact, what's getting reverberated is this um, tracheal cartilage up here. The bright part is going to be the mucosal lining. And so we start getting this repeating all the way down, okay? Um, oftentimes you won't get such a nice repeating because the air in the trachea will scatter the sound beam and most of the time all of this will just end up getting shadowed out. Because this is so medial, again let's talk about relational anatomy, we actually can't quite make out any um, uh, sternocleidomastoid because of how far over this particular probe is, but we can certainly make out our strap muscles. All right, so this is just a, a summary of that so that you could see it all in one image. Common artifacts, let me touch on common artifacts. And when we look at this, let's remember that they can be useful or they can be annoying. Um, they can be useful in telling us what the structure um, anterior to that particular artifact is. Um, they can be annoying, like when a rib shadows out an area we want to see, or when bowel gas scatters our sound beam and gives us a dirty shadow. So absorptive shadow and dirty shadowing can sometimes be problematic. Now, these are fluid-filled structures, so of course we have our standby. Look at this nice column of increased echogenicity deep to the IJV. This is your typical um, posterior enhancement. We do get some posterior enhancement from the CCA as well, but then that uh, longest colony really absorbs all of that energy really quickly, but we have our standard PAE. We also have an artifact that's typical of structures that are curved, and so oftentimes we'll see them in, again, in cystic or fluid-filled structures, where the sound beam is coming straight down, it hits a curved reflective surface, and refracts away, does not return any echo, and so the machine believes that there is nothing there and places these black lines. You see these black lines on either side. Now there's a little something going on causing another one here, and the two are joining together and creating this thicker edge here. But the, the point is, um, it is called an edge artifact, and any kind of curved, highly reflective structure can do this, and so we see a little bit of refraction going on here and some refraction going along right this way. So this is edge artifact. It's a kind of refractive artifact. And then, of course, we can't leave out our posterior acoustic shadowing. So this particular trachea um, does use up that sound beam. We're hitting the um, cartilage, and then the air is scattering the rest of the sound beam and uh, so there isn't enough energy to continue on and we get this deep shadow underneath. Now I'll just point out this one, we are getting um, a little bit of, of um, uh, attenuation of the sound beam from what just happens to be a thicker piece of collagen or, or connective tissue within these, this sternocleidomastoid. Let's talk about this pyramidal lobe. 
So the parameter lobe, um, it depends on what you read and what populations, I guess, that are being studied in that particular research. And I've heard this number go up to even 40%. And, and I can tell you that in 20 years of scanning that I don't see them that often. And so I feel like this is probably closer to the percentage. I, I, I could be completely wrong, but I'm just going anecdotally on what I have seen and also on some research that I have read. So this is a third lobe, if, we, if you will, that it can extend off of either lobe, off either main lobe, or it can extend off the isthmus. And depending on what you read, some will say uh, it will come off of the left side more often than the right. Some will say the opposite. Um, and, they'll, and some will say that very few comes, come directly off of the isthmus. I will say that they typically will come off at least at where that juncture is between the isthmus and, and whatever lobe it's going to come off of. The point is it's going to have a similar echo texture or should have exactly the same echo texture as the, um, as the thyroid gland, only it's more finger-like and can extend and reach all the way up to the uh, thyroid cartilage and maybe even a little higher depending on uh, development. And if we look at it on ultrasound, you will see that here is that isthmus, and I've said that the isthmus is going to typically be below the cricoid cartilage. Here is our cricoid cartilage, and here is our isthmus. Here is our thyroid cartilage, is our thyroid cartilage, and there is this finger-like projection. Now, this one is thicker than most I've seen. Um, it's not as as drawn here as as finger-like, but it's kind of kind of is and one of the telltale signs is you're always going to see this sort of cinched off area um, where this uh, at the connection point a little cinched off area but um, if you turn long on it you should be able to make out the cartilages and be able to see just how far up this a pyramidal lobe will go let's talk about some thyroid pathologies. So when we look at uh, the thyroid gland, you saw it normal thyroid where it had that smooth um, homogeneous uh, uh, echo texture. And when it becomes very enlarged, which is what goiter means, goiter means an enlargement, and um, it can develop many nodules in it. And we would term that as multinodular goiter. Some of these goiters can get very large and you can actually see them protruding through the neck of someone. Okay, actually protruding through the neck here. You can actually see the heads of the sternocleidomastoid as it pushes through and, and, and against the musculature. When we look at that on ultrasound, here we have our trachea. And here we have the left thyroid gland, which looks relatively normal, at least in size and mostly um, normal tissue within it, although there is a small hyperechoic nodule, almost isoechoic nodule uh, on this lateral aspect. But check out this. This is all multinodular goiter. So very enlarged thyroid gland with lots of nodules in there, so many that we can't even define them and pick them out. We can sort of see some uh, at the edge of border of this one here, but all of this is just made up of multiple nodules and look how displaced the CCA is. Now, when do we do anything about this? Let me just go ahead and show you what this is going to look like in long axis. So if we turn on this, we can see the very, very enlarged thyroid gland and lots of nodules in there, quite large nodules. Um, and when we do something about this is when there is a functional um, discomfort. So this is getting pretty large. It can be pressing against the trachea and the esophagus and cause problems with swallowing and breathing. Um, 
it can compress against or irritate the uh, recurrent laryngeal nerve. And when it does that, you might hear a person have some hoarseness to their voice. So this is a, a decision that has to be made from the uh, individual clinical perspective and um, what would serve the patient better. Obviously, if this thyroid is removed, as you know, um, they have to be very cautious not to damage the, um, the recurrent laryngeal nerve. And so they uh, try to identify that and protect it um, as uh, well as any other nerves nearby, as well as the parathyroid gland. So remember that that parathyroid gland is going to be posterior to the thyroid. We don't typically see them, but they'll be located posterior to the thyroid. And so they have to be careful not to remove those glands either. Fortunately, as long as you have some parathyroid um, uh, tissue in there, um, it, it's there, there's less of a chance of, of causing um, uh, what could be catastrophic um, consequences if those um, parathyroid glands are removed. As you know, it, you have to have parathyroid glands. Not, it's just without them, that's just not compatible with life. So there has to be um, a lot of caution with that. All right. Now, oops, let's see. Well, so what other pathologies may be associated with goiter? So associated with an enlarged thyroid or thyroid megaly of some kind. Um, so if we associate it with hypothyroidism or an under-functioning thyroid gland, so remember that our thyroid gland uh, is intimately involved with our metabolism, and so uh, hypothyroidism um, with goiter is going to be associated with Hashimoto's thyroiditis or chronic lymphocytic thyroiditis. What happens, you get these little islands of tissue and on ultrasound, what we tend to see are all of these tiny little islands of tissue in here, all these islands of tissue. In addition, um, these, this gland will become um, fibrotic over time. And so you get these linear densities here, these septa, um, and this can occur not only in um, hypothyroidism with goiter, but it can also occur in hyperthyroidism with goiter. So you have some enlargement of the thyroid gland as well here. Sometimes it's not so cut and dry whether the person has um, 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 thyroiditis or whether the person has thyrotoxicosis. That has to be looked at from the point of view of the blood work. However, um, you can see a difference in the appearance. You don't get these little islands of tissue with, um, with Graves' disease. Uh, you still get this kind of lobular contour and you still get this enlargement and um, you'll still get some fibrotic changes as well. And um, when we look at these from a, a vascular point of view, this is where they have very in common they're going to have hyperemia. So both Hashimoto's and Graves sonographically, both conditions will demonstrate hyperemia. Hyper meaning a lot of emia we're talking about the blood. So this would be normal vascular flow and the normal thyroid just have a good supply of vascular flow. And when you turn on your color flow, you'll get this really just, you know, just goes to town. Sometimes this is called thyroid inferno. Um, by, by some radiologists. So you'll really see just a huge increase in the flow. And so this would be indicative of uh, an uncontrolled condition, right? So they need to, they need to get the condition under control. Um, and um, they obviously can do that with, with medications or treating the underlying cause. Now, the overwhelming majority, let's talk about solid versus cystic nodules. I will tell you that a huge number of people have thyroid nodules and never know that they do. And the older that we get, the more predisposed we are to developing these nodules on our thyroid gland. Now, the vast majority of them, and this number of approximately 95%, I, I, I actually got that 
um, saw that not only at a, a, a thyroid society website, but also even at uh, Johns, a Johns Hopkins uh, research paper that showed that uh, the overwhelming majority being approximately 95%, which means that only about 5% of these nodules are going to be cancerous. And um, uh, you may think, well, you know, what are the uh, the odds don't mean a thing if you end up on the wrong side of those odds. Well, I will tell you that with thyroid cancer, it's a very treatable cancer. Do people die of thyroid cancer? Yes, they do. But for the most part, thyroid cancer is a very treatable cancer. And some certain cancers can just remain indolent within, within the thyroid gland, and they are actually found after uh, maybe on the autopsy. And um, it never really... Um, had an impact on that person's life. So solid nodules are going to be, as the name implies, they're not going to have any fluid areas, no cystic areas. Now, can there be a mixture of solid and cystic? Yes, there can. And But I just wanted to show you the obvious difference between a solid nodule and a cystic nodule. This one has three nodules in it, actually. And you can see that sometimes they are hyperechoic to the surrounding tissue. Sometimes they are hypoechoic to the surrounding tissue, and sometimes they are isoechoic to the surrounding tissue and can be subtle, but we can pick up the borders around it. A cystic structure, as you know, is going to be anechoic, but it might have some tiny little foci in it or a single foci. One or two is not a big deal. It's when we have multiple of them and a larger uh, like cystic solid structure where we kind of look at them as scants but when it's just a single little um, ditzel, as I call them, or a single little focus, uh, and they have this almost, com well, they do have this comet tail appearance to them. And this is actually comet tail artifact off of a very tiny uh, colloid clump here. And so these are colloid cysts, and they're really quite common. Now this is a left thyroid gland and one of the things that I didn't talk about in the anatomy was there was one other guest uh, appearance going on here on this left side and you may be able to see this on some of you and that is going to be the esophagus. On the left side we can actually make out the esophagus as well and uh, so you can even make out a good number of the layers, adventitia, the muscular layer, and the um, submucosal layer in here. So that would be on the left side. So typically, the esophagus is seen posterior left side snug up against the trachea. Typically, the left side. Now, how, when we look at these nodules, what are we looking at from um, the sonographer is going uh, to be looking at these to evaluate them as to which ones the radiologist is going to want to report upon. The radiologist follows something called a thyroid imaging reporting and data system. This is a relatively new system, and so it's not as widespread as it could be yet, but it will be. Um, the, um, this is similar to what is used in BIRADS, which is breast imaging reporting and data system for um, mammography, but has been expanded to include ultrasound and MRI in the BIRADS um, lexicon. In the TIRADS lexicon, we find that cancers or benign structures have similar characteristics in um, glandular tissue, similar characteristics in glandular tissue and in other kinds of tissue, but typically in glandular tissue. So this lexicon allows us to, to use the same words when we're describing something, so that if the radiologist reads it in Virginia, a radiologist in California is using the same terminology, and so there's, there's no um, misunderstanding of what is meant. And that's really important in reporting. So the um, American College came out, uh, ACR came out with their white papers in um, 2013 and 2015, I believe, um, and maybe even 2017. But the hasn't been out that long, but they were able to pin down what descriptors would look more 
like a um, benign process or it looks more like a malignant process. And what that's doing is just guiding us in the management of our patient. Do we just survey surveillance on this nodule over say a one to two per year period of time or do we put a needle in it and do a biopsy? And that's what these reporting systems help us do. They're really talking about the percent chance of it being cancerous. So the lower the number, the much lower chance of it having cancer, less than 2% or 2 to 10% or 10 to 30%. So it goes up the scale as percentage of chance that it's malignant. So characteristics here. So I, I didn't want to use one of the benign ones for it. I wanted to show you how this would work if we were looking at a structure and, and wanted to know whether we needed to stick a needle in here or whether it was highly suspicious um, in terms of, of, of of a percentage chance of it being a malignant process. So when we look at composition, um, here is your composition right here, and I hope you can see this. I know it's kind of small, but this one is going to be a solid um, uh, or, or almost completely solid one because there can be tiny little cystic areas and it still be called solid because there might be just some small areas of degeneration in it. So because this is mostly solid or completely solid, this gets two points. If we look at the echogenicity, we can see that, remember that that tissue of the thyroid gland, this has a very similar echogenicity. We can see a little bit of thyroid tissue up here. And so we would call this an isoechoic nodule, and it gets one point for being isoechoic. So not too high on the point scale for that. If we then move to the shape, now this one is super important. Shape is really important. Remember when I said that those lymph nodes start getting more rounded, they start losing that ratio? Um, well, nodules, and this is true of masses in the breast too, once they begin to get taller than wide, start, start really um, changing that ratio in a significant way that we call taller than wide. The AP diameter is taller than the um, um, than a, a width diameter. So in nodules we would measure them in transverse and we would compare its height to its width. And this is taller than wide and that gets a whopping three points. All right, margins are smooth. Margins are important too. In this case though, this one is smooth. The more irregular the margins are, the more suspicious it is, but this one's smooth and so we only give it zero points. And if we look for multiple echogenic foci, remember I said on that little colloid cyst, you might get a, you know, just one to, to maybe just a few little punctate echogenic, echogenic foci. Here we have quite a number of them throughout the um, um, lesion here. So quite a number of these little punctate echogenic foci. And so that got another whopping three points because when there are a lot of them like that, um, the, the, they're more suspicious. So now we add it all together and we get nine points. And if we look at our TIRADS rating, we go all the way over here to seven points or more. And this one got a a um, TR rating of five, so it's highly suspicious. And then we decide, well, how do we approach this? If it is large enough, it needs to be at least a centimeter before we biopsy it. If they are less than a centimeter, we follow it. Um, remember, these are slow growing cancers, and so we're not talking about an emergency situation here. So when they're below one centimeter, really don't do anything about it until it gets to a centimeter or greater. So if this is a centimeter greater, which this one clearly is, then we stick a needle in there and get ourselves um, some uh, a biopsy done. Okay, so that's how we rate thyroid tissue. I, 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 if you're in, interested in going into en, um, en, endocrinology or if you're going into radiology, I'm, I'm hoping this information was uh, at least helpful for you as to how we, we look at thyroid nodules and also looking at um, vascular disease and, um, and looking at how lymph nodes can help us as well. Uh, okay, that's it. So thank you very much, and I will see you in the ultrasound lab.